My guest today is an actor whose long career will always be defined by one role. Henry Winkler was the Fonz, the cool dude at the center of the US TV show Happy Days, which was a worldwide hit in the 70s and 80s. The show portrayed an innocent, untroubled 1950s America. It was a far cry from Winkler's own childhood, which was clouded by undiagnosed dyslexia. How did a troubled kid come to be a symbol of sunny optimism? And what happened to the idealized America of happy days? Henry Winkler, welcome to Hard Talk. I'm happy to be here. I want to begin by taking you back to 1974, the first airing of the show Happy Days, right. which was to become a massive hit. Did you have a gut instinct when you first played Arthur Fonzarelli, the Fonz, that that was going to happen? No. Uh, I remember I was hired uh, as a fringe character, so I had six lines. I would work one day a week. I would sit in my apartment most of the rest of the week because I couldn't play during a work week. But I had no work because I only worked one day a week. So, uh, and then remember also we did it one camera, like a little movie. So the, we had 12, um, we, we shot 12 shows. We were number 48th in the country. If we did not get any better in the ratings, we were gone. They were going to can you. They were going to can us. And in September 1975, they came up with the idea of doing it in front of a live audience, like one of the comedies that uh, were famous during the 70s. And that's what we did. And immediately, it turned the show around. And how did you manage to muscle your way into becoming, let's be honest, the, the key character, the one that the show built itself around? Do you know what? I, I, I did nothing but uh, concentrate on my character. And the character muscled his way into the hearts of um, the world. Let's go back to that time. You know, the mid-70s through the mid-80s, it was a... A time when America was desperate for something optimistic to think about. You know, you'd been through Watergate, you'd right. been through Vietnam, right. through the civil rights struggles. Right. But it is odd, is it not, looking back at that show, that it didn't reflect any of the reality of a tense America. Well, I think that was the, uh, that was the, the main thought behind the show. Pure and escapism. The, uh, pure escapism, and that was what Gary Marshall, um, the genius behind that show, and Mork and Mindy, and Laverne and Shirley, and The Odd Couple, and great movies, um, you know, Pretty Woman. He's my Don. I kiss his ring, Gary Marshall. But he says... You know, other people make television that is really, like, supposed to be smart. I make recess. <laughs> but there's something about making recess that, at a time like that, is a little bit Well, strange, believe it or not, I, see, I, I, it's, it is a, a timeless show. He made it in the 50s on purpose because you could do moral stories without ever feeling like you were being hit on the head. Uh, with uh, the point of view. But I suppose what I'm getting at, that even portraying 50s America as, as that place of, of tight families, close-knit communities where every kid got into scrapes but basically had a heart of gold, it just, it was fantasy. It was never true of the 50s or any other decade in the United well, States. Well, the, the fact is that uh, why I think it was so popular is uh, you wanted a family like that. So children who were latchkey kids who came home and had a key to open their apartment and there was nobody there, they wanted the Cunninghams. They wanted a friend like the Fonz who they thought would take care of them. Yeah, I mean, I just, maybe I'm over-reading politics into this, but I'm very aware that through the course of making these, the, the shows, 10 years, um, you had the Carter years, which were difficult, and then you had the rise of Ronald Reagan and a certain form of sunny, optimistic conservatism, that phrase, morning in America. And it just seems to me that the whole show 
in a way, was the epitome of what Reagan wanted to believe America was all about. Wow. I met Reagan, a um, very nice fellow, uh, not my politics. So Are you I, buying my analysis, though? Uh, you know what? It, it is a very interesting point of view that I have never thought about, because even today, in 2013, people are watching it somewhere in the, in the world. Yeah, they are. I just you know, it wonder. Just, it was just uh, uh, rerun in America. What I'm saying is, mm. I don't know if I, I think that that optimism uh, is important for human beings. They they uh, are having a hard time getting a job. It is uh, always difficult to f to find a job. They are beat up in the world outside. They come home. I don't think people want cutting edge television no matter how you cut it. So I now want to bring it to the very personal story of Henry Winkler, Winkler because you, you were involved in this very sunny, optimistic show. And yet, yes. of course, you know, you were a young man and you knew, of course, you were highly aware that your own child, your own upbringing had been far from completely sunny right. and optimistic. That Not least true. because your parents had been through hell, really. Right. They just, just managed to escape from Nazi That's Germany right. before the Holocaust hit the Jewish community. Right. Um, and it sounds to me as though your, your relationship with your parents was, was troubled. And your relationship certainly with school was also troubled. My parents did not get who I was as an individual. So that was really difficult. Uh, it was only after my success that they became proud. So I admire them for having escaped Nazi Germany. I admire them for starting this brand new life in America. I am grateful for the life that I had, but emotionally it was, um, no matter how you uh, look at it, it was for me very difficult. And then I promised myself that I would be a different parent with my own children. And in the course of the interview, I want to get to your own parenting and your own kids, but, but just sticking with your own youth for mm -hmm. a, a little while longer. I was born an optimist. I believe that to be true. But do you think the, 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 the difficulties in your relationship with your parents, was it in part a result of maybe psychological damage done to them by their own experience That's in Germany and the possible. loss of their own parents? That's very possible. Because they lost their parents, Yes, they did. They? We lost everybody. I, I actually never had a real uh, aunt or uncle. They were all the community of those people who escaped Germany and came to New York. So that, uh, that community that uh, uh, stayed very tight, uh, they became my aunts and my uncles. Uh, however, they were not blood. Uh, lacking a wider support network within the family, you also lacked a nurturing school because uh, let's get onto the subject of, of dyslexia, right. which has, again, colored a lot of your life. You had real trouble, didn't you, learning at school? I have a lot of trouble learning, even today. You don't ever outgrow your uh, dyslexia. You learn to negotiate it. So, yes, it was really difficult because I was told in so many areas in my life that I would never achieve, that I'm an underachiever. Uh, and then that's the title of the book, uh, Hank Zipser, the world's greatest underachiever. Yeah, Hank Zipser being the character you created right. to, to help other kids. No, uh, I, no? They, uh, I didn't, it never entered my mind that I was helping anybody. Uh, I was writing what I knew right. uh, with my partner, Lynn Oliver, and it turned out that kids wrote back and said, how did you know me so well? I thought I was alone. Uh, now I know I'm not stupid. But you partly thought you were stupid because, again, without wishing to pick into difficult stuff, your own parents told you you were yes. stupid. Yes, well, they, you know, I, I make a joke. Uh, I've said this uh, before, but uh, uh, they had a, an affectionate phrase for me growing up, which was, dumme Hund. Uh, and then if you... Well, I know what trim, that means. Yeah, it, it means it, dumb dog. Yeah, yeah, which isn't really very affectionate at all, no. is it? No. No, it's a, it's a name I never used, actually, on my own children. Then, of course, uh, my son, Max, who is now a director, uh, was interviewed for his first film. He said, my biggest problem growing up, I was loved too much. <laughs> You know, you can smile about it, and it's wonderful to see yes. you relate these stories with, with a smile, but I just wonder... 
when you've used phrases in the past, like my self-esteem was around my ankles. Yes. I mean, just how damaged do you think you were? The, you know what? It, I believe that there are three um, very important elements to living. One is that you remain relevant. And I don't mean you remain famous or you remain in the public eye. I, remain, I mean that you remain uh, constantly um, giving out of yourself into the universe. So that's one. That does sound a little bit Californian to me. But no, I no. think that's uh, universal. Yes? I, under, I, I really believe. As soon as a, a human being is dismissed, is no longer useful, I believe that they, um, uh, they squeeze up into a raisin, actually. Well, you and didn't do that. that box. No, you were never a raisin. I mean, what, what you did with a very a difficult schooling and a problematic relationship with your parents, you, you found something where you could express yourself. And, and in some ways, it's counterintuitive because it was acting. You were a shy kid, you were a yes, troubled kid, true. and then suddenly you sort of flowered on, on stage. But I didn't know that. I mean, I, I've always wanted to be a, a, an actor. I mean, I, I didn't even think about, oh, why? Oh, how did that come mm. into my body, in my mind? I just always had that as a dream. Was it because, you know, we talked about escapism before in terms of happy days, but maybe it was the place you be. could escape. You know what? I never thought of that. But yes, that might be exactly why. Uh, whatever the reason, I trained uh, to be an actor, and I now am living every day. I'm 67 years old. I, I'm still working as an actor. I am living my dream every day. It's amazing. How on earth did you, and maybe do you, because you're still a, very much a working actor, cope with read-throughs and I was quickly reading and learning lines and I memorizing? I was embarrassed. When I when read-through, just to, um, does everybody know, it, it, Monday morning we would read through the script uh, for the writers and the producers. They could hear it. It would be the beginning of the rehearsal That's right. to, to make the show that Friday. And you're struggling to read. Struggling. Struggled to this so how, day. So how, how did you get away with it? I didn't. I stumbled and I was embarrassed and I learned to live with my embarrassment. I finally said, you know what? This is me. This is how I get through it. And um, my heart races at every read through till this day. And what, even worse, I dare say you don't really audition so much now. Everybody knows who you are and what you can do. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. I, I don't know what it's like here, but in America, you have to audition. And if you're given a, a, a script, that I you're going to... How do you mean? But I memorize as much of it as I can. I uh, then do the script, uh, and I make up what I know to be the nature of the scene. And people say to me, well, that wasn't what was written. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but I'm going to do it <laughs> verbatim if I get the job. <laughs> Let's, let's go back to, to those 10 years on Happy Days just for a moment longer. Because there you are, you've established this character right. of the Fonz. Right. But you've already said to me, you know, you were a highly trained actor. I believe you even trained in drama at Yale University I and a got a master's degree. degree. In acting, yes. Well, hey, was it not incredibly frustrating when the Fonz's sort of big thing was slouching onto stage with his leather jacket, sort of drawling? Hey, and, no. and sticking his thumbs up. No, yeah. and I'll tell, you, you I'll tell you why. I was trained, yes, I was trained to be an actor. I was not trained to be an elitist. So I loved that character. That character introduced me to the world, 126 countries. I got mail from 126 countries, from people who said, you make me laugh. And I want to be your friend. I would visit with my children, we would visit the Hopi Nation in Arizona because in the third year, they studied American, Native Americans. But is it elitist of me now, to wait say to you, no. Henry Winkler, it didn't stretch you, you were talented. That's not true because every single thing that I use, but let me just finish the story. Mm. We went to the Hopi Nation and uh, people would walk out of their homes with fresh bread and give it to me because the Fonz was respectful to Native Americans in a Thanksgiving show or holiday. Mm. But it is not elitist of you to ask the question. It is, I used every bit of my training as the Fonz. 
the uh, I'll just say the um, uh, the episode with Mork and Mindy when Mork was first introduced to the world. I used the slow motion training that I used with a Polish um, uh, teacher mm. who studied Grotowski, who was a famous director, and we learned slow motion and how to use our bodies. I used that in the Fonz. I love that image, and I love the fact that you know you 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 can bring so much to everything you did in that show. Right. I just wonder then I could how much not, it hurt. I could not have brought everything I did to the show if I didn't have the training. So how much did it hurt when the magic of Happy Days began to slip away and people started, frankly, to mock it from time to time? And then there was that moment, and actually it occurred relatively early on in, in, in the decade of, of Happy Days, where you did that dramatic thing when you were water skiing and yes. you jumped over a yes, shark. I and did. before too long, that phrase, jumping the shark, right. had become a sort a of stock game. phrase to it's encapsulate amazing. gimmicky desperation to win an audience. Right. And they were sort of okay, laughing so at Happy Days. So, first of all, yeah, well, that's okay because Happy Days is still on and that phrase, that board game is gone. But, uh, you know, I, we were number one for about four to five years after uh, that phrase came into being. And I had really good legs at that time. So every time in the newspaper they would use the phrase jumping the shark, they would show me on water skis. I looked pretty damn good. I was okay. <laughs> now, the other issue, I suppose, for any actor, and, and not so long ago on the show, we interviewed uh, William Shatner, who, of course... Very wonderful fellow. Uh, but fair or not, will always be defined by Captain Kirk. That's just okay. as you have you, the character he was, who defined... He, he, he's a great stage actor. Uh, he now... He, I think he invested in, but, the, in a company that it does uh, commercials all the time in New York. But my point, I guess, yes. uh, without going too far into him, because I've already seen him, yeah, is, right. is with you, whether... Isn't he great? I did his talk show. Yeah, you had lots of different shows. You produced, you directed, you yes. acted, of course, and you still do. Yes. You've had some hits. You've had My some proudest favorites. moment. Proudest moment are the novels that I wrote with Lynn Oliver. Really? Yeah. Not acting at all. N no, no, they are they are my proudest moments outside of my uh, rude children. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk about the book Good. because they, they bring us back to dyslexia, which sure. has been a huge theme through your life. But, yes. but I, final question on this yes. acting. Do you ever wonder what if, what if I hadn't won that part? What if I hadn't yes, played I think about the, it all the time. Would I actually have gotten more out of my acting career? No, I couldn't have gotten more. I now, at this moment in 2013, I do three television shows. I act on a show called Children's Hospital which started as a webisode on the web. On the internet. Yeah. On the internet. Last year won the uh, Emmy for the best short, um, uh, uh, you know, short uh, comedy. Uh, it's only 11 minutes long at 12 o'clock at night because it's absurdist. I do uh, Royal Pains, which is shown right here on uh, a terrestrial channel. Mm. I don't know the name. So and you're not gonna you're not gonna go to your grave bitter about typecasting. I am not and, bitter no. at all. I am grateful. I live by two words: tenacity, and gratitude. Tenacity got me to this chair, and gr and and gratitude does not allow me to be angry about most things, except In my daughter's use of our credit card. Interesting, you talk about anger because like absurd. I, <laughs> that's perhaps a private conversation wow. to be had, but yeah. but interesting you talk about anger because I can't help comparing. If your you. daughter has a credit card, <laughs> allow me now to suggest a shredder. Okay. I have a daughter of my own. I can How relate old? to that. But well, she's fifteen, so she well, hasn't got 15. one yet. She's, but, no, but she's getting there. Yeah, well, she will be. Let, it let, will let, shock let, you, Henry. Bring, let will me bring. It will shock you. Yes, I your know. Your mortgage is going to a pair of shoes. I'm just going to tell you now. Well, you've told me. Jimmy Shoes, you could have, uh, you know, or Shoes, could have bought a house. You just mentioned something interesting about anger. Go ahead. I want to have you reflect on what we see among some of the equivalents of Henry Winkler in the TV business today. That is the biggest stars. Thinking yes. of people like Charlie Sheen. Right. Uh, maybe him more than any other. Right. The sorts of behavior they've indulged in when they're at the top of that television tree, right. very different from yours. Right. And you've always talked about the importance in any production of being a team player. Do you think that has disappeared from the modern No, there are wonderful, there are wonderful uh, team players. Here's the problem. 
you are treated almost like a deity. You walk in the street, people want to touch you, want some of your clothes, would like to cut your hair to have some, uh, you know. You cannot believe what people are telling you. I am still short. I did not grow one inch because I was famous. I am still Henry. I know only what I know. I am not an authority now on stuff I don't know. You want so badly to buy in. You want so badly to believe I'm special. I can walk on water. And it just isn't true. And there are lots of people who don't, who, who make a, a pact with the devil and go down that road. And it will destroy you like you were hit by a car, like, a, like an oncoming train. Uh, that kind of uh, hubris mm. will cut you in half. Honestly, that is the truth. Before we end, yes. Before we end, I do want to spend a little more time uh, talking about dyslexia with you because okay. you've turned that into one of your life's works. And you talked about the pride you have in the books you've written, yes. which of course relate to that through your character you created. But you have in your own life, yes, children. I do. Who, who have oh, had and they are dyslexic. Too. So tell me this: in your view, now that you know as much as you do about dyslexia, yes. Is it this genetic is what I know. in origin? What, what do you know about it? How? I know that it is hereditary. So those families that have children who learn differently and that are embarrassed by the child because it does not live up to snuff, you've created it, actually. It comes from your genes, parents out there. Is there sometimes, though, a danger of overdiagnosis? That, yes. You know, kids have different talents, talents, different intellectual abilities. Absolutely. And maybe sometimes, and maybe particularly in America where I live But I'll while, tell you where the danger, danger of, really is. Mm -hmm. Here's the real danger in not allowing it to be true, in, not, in telling a child they're just lazy, in telling a child it doesn't exist, just work a little harder. You, you know, change the curriculum and learn Latin and you're gonna be like a great student. Mm. And there are, there are children who are wired to learn a foreign language and I lived in a family that spoke German and I know just a few words. I, my brain doesn't, comprehend it. Why do we only um, celebrate the top 10% when it is the bottom 10% that create um, a plastered room, uh, an art piece? Uh, uh, they are great athletes. Uh, but they also, uh, dyslexia, you, you learn to meet your destiny. Why don't we help them? And Well, what is the help? You know, you've spent a lot of time. You've not just written the books. You've visited schools. You've you know been what involved I tell in them? programs. What is the key? Do you know what I tell them? Mm. Here's, the, for me, the key. Acknowledge that the child is having trouble. Realize that their self-image is imploding because the, you don't have to tell a child that you're not doing well in school. They know. They know how hard it is to write the math problem or to, to learn a language or to, to read a book. They know. You support them and make sure that their self-image is powerful and strong and they will meet their destiny. We began by talking about optimism. Yes. You come across to me as one of the most optimistic. I, I've I'm ever telling met. you. You know how I see my life? You know that toy that has sand at the bottom? You punch it, it goes down and then... Whoosh, it, it comes right back to center, right? You blow it up, plastic. That's how I see myself. I go down, I get back up, and here I am sitting in this chair. I've written 23 novels with my uh, partner, uh, a brand new one about uh, a Ghost Buddy, which sounds like the Fonz. Hey, I want, you could call me a banshee, but that's rude. Call me a phantom. Oh, I could live with that. Henry Winkler is a great way to end. Thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. What a pleasure, really. Thank you it's very much. It's a great much. conversation.